How's everybody doing tonight? Woo! <sighs> okay, so uh, my name is Bilal, and I'm, I'm generally like a pretty cozy person. I don't know why everyone's sitting so far away. Maybe the last panel were kind of intimidating, you know, like Big Shot and stuff like that. You got Raiko coming all the way from who knows where and all that. <laughs> so please, uh, the blue chairs are magic. You won't know why they're magic until you try. They're magic, right? Yeah. Yeah, so please, like, check, check out the blue chairs. I know Bruce likes the last or the first. I'm suggesting the first. <laughs> okay, uh, looks like I still don't got any video. Um, how, about, how about a math rap? I think I've done this one before, but uh, it goes 6.02 times 10 to 23. That's about how many guards I keep to keep my keep free from the freaks who seek it. Dude, that's a big number, and shoot, I mean it. If you had that many atoms of an atom, you get its atomic mass in grams. Dude, that's far to fathom, sirs and madams, but I'm Papa Mole, and this is my mole rap. I've got a pistol and a goose feather cap, and I'm coming through, so you's all better scat. So does anybody know what that song was about? Yeah? What was it about? Avogadro's number, great. Yeah, so now you know I'm an Uber nerd. I hope that proves my credentials. I don't, I'm not a card-carrying member of any sort of like ACM or anything like that, so I, I gotta like have something with me. Um, is it not gonna work? Ah. So I guess instead of showing you pictures, I can tell you a little bit about uh, what's going on. So I grew up as an Uber nerd, loved reading encyclopedias and stuff, kinda like to, uh, play with electronics and look for rocks and try to figure out how they worked. And I was always really curious about like how stuff worked and I would take things apart. And uh, I grew up and I found myself finding other people kind of like me. We started developing these community spaces, you know? And slowly, like my, my knowledge about the importance of understanding how the world works started to form and develop. And I started finding myself in these communities and spaces of people kind of like me, uber, uber nerds that like memorize Avogadro to like 20 digits and Pi to 35 or even more. And <clears throat> we were all sitting there and we were building and we were being innovative and we were being creative and they call themselves hackers. And I felt at home at last. You know, when I was a, a youngster, I basically would just stay by myself playing with like, uh, trying to make a microphone out of like a pencil lead and, and all that jazz. But uh, it took me until college, until leaving Michigan and living in a dorm at MIT without, without really going to the school. I just kind of put my body <laughs> in Cambridge, Massachusetts to find my geeky friends that were creative, uh, problem solving. They were interested in technology, but the humanities at the same time. They were uh, reading jitterbug perfume and like making their own chemical, uh, chemistry experiments in their dorm rooms. And I, and I finally found the people that I loved. And uh, after that experience, I started, I, I went back to Michigan, and I realized that I wanted to share whatever I experienced there with my community in Michigan, where I grew up. And so I helped establish the hackerspace in Michigan called All Hands Active. We raised the flag, and we're like, all right, Uber nerds, all right, all you guys who know pi to x number digits, and you know, like play with little things and little doodads, and oh, I'm a d and uh, how about you come and hang out? And it was really cool. Once we had a flag to put up, and we had like a little rhinoceros with a key sticking out of it, like a wind-up rhino that was breathing fire, people knew that there were other people like them that they could like learn from and share from and grow and develop. And so we were, ah, oh, look at this. Looks like we're gonna get close. Ooh, my Twitter pops up too. Um, and so we were like building all of this really, really fun and interesting things. Uh, are we good? I don't know, I, I don't wanna do this. Oh shoot, I broke something. Um, what I want to do, uh, 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 where's the clicker? Game over. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'll go back to describing it in words. I'm painting a picture with language. Okay, so imagine this place, right? It's in a basement, it's dark, there's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of, like tools all over the wall, right? And people sitting there, they're either drawing or they're painting or they're like soldering something together. And I was like, you know what? We should start like making stuff and like making money to support ourselves. And so I thought about entrepreneurship as a way to take the stuff that I love to do and to like create a life. And it was awesome. So um, me and my friend Andrew were building these robots and we were in Detroit and they were like gonna help people move, uh, they replace assembly lines and, and all sorts of, fun and, and super nerdy stuff. 
and the revolution started happening in the Middle East. And at this time, I had previous experience in Syria meeting up with my family. So I'm from Iraq originally, and I haven't been able to go to the country for a vast majority of my life. Because who knows what happened in Iraq from like 1980 to, I guess, still ongoing. <laughs> yeah? What was going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's really confusing for me, right? Like being American and Iraqi and like having all these feelings. And, um, yeah, so basically there's just been like continuous war and violence. And so every time we want to go back, my parents are like, yeah, my wedge that's so we mashakil ba'dha, I need it to something, something, something. It's like, don't go, it's bad. We'll figure it out. And the thing that we figured out is like, we still want to be connected to our family. So we met up with them in Syria, back when Syria was safe. And it was great. There were figs growing, just like in Kosovo. God, you don't understand how much I love you guys' as figs. Your figs are amazing. You gotta, like, every morning I go out and, like, check which ones are ripe. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of my time in Syria. It brings back really good memories. Um, but when I was in Syria, I had met up with my cousin. And my cousin was uh, a little older than me. He, he, like, grabs me by my leg and, like, stares at me straight in the eyes. And he says, Bilal, get me out of here. Do you have $10,000, $25,000? I can get into the underground market and get myself to, 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 like, Sweden. Okay, I can do it. Okay, how about, how about, can you, like, marry me to some American lady? You got to know some Americans. You live in America, right? Yeah, how hard could that be? And, and basically, he scared me. He, like, I felt really kind of strange about being frightened by my cousin. So that was when I started. So who here, like, as a geek, I'm a problem solver, Right? And I started coming up against problems that I'm not, like, really good at solving. Like, I, give me, like, a broken chair and, like, some duct tape. I'm like, okay, you know what we could do? We could, like, you know, we got some tree branches, la-di-da, tape things together. You can fix it, right? And, and, like, things have solutions, generally. And so he came up to me with this problem. And my brain started going, solution, 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 solution. And I kind of, like, went back and forth. I was like, oh, da, 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 da. I don't know really exactly what to do. And I guess sleep so far away over there. And so... Um, my, my solution was to look into my life and see what gave me hope and optimism and to try to find ways to bring that value system, that attitude, to the Middle East where my family is from. And so I looked at entrepreneurship. And I thought that for me, whenever I confronted a problem in the future, I, see, I, see, I saw entrepreneurship as a way of like participating in creating the future. If the future is scary, it doesn't matter because it, it doesn't have to be that way. You can participate in creating a future that you, you want to see. And like an entrepreneurial attitude is about looking at challenges, instead of calling them problems, calling them puzzles to solve, right? And so th that was really interesting. And I wanted to figure out how to bring this, like, this idea that, that um, I had over and sharing it. And as I, as I went to MIT and I learned about the hacker attitude and I learned about these hacker spaces, I found something that I thought was like a good vehicle, you know? Before you tell people, go out and start businesses because, you know, if, if money is the, the main motivator, then I don't think the values get uh, exchanged uh, first. And so I thought we can do like pre-incubator style, hackerspaces, people being creative, innovative, problem solving. And so I started trying to figure out ways to share this. And so this is like up until 2011. This is what my brain was doing. I was like, okay, revolution's happening in the Middle East. Perfect time. Clicker. Okay. So I guess what I wanted to do really quickly is... Uh, uh huh. I wanted to show you some like pictures of stuff. So here's the robot that I was telling you about that I was building. It, the emergency stop is very safely in my hand with a long wire attached to it. This is like a shirt that lets me feel things through my skin. This is how we <laughs> break into safes at the first hackerspace I was a part of um, called Miters. Uh, this is a laser cutter that I made with two scanners and metal bars attached to them. And you know, I was just like making stuff. I, I was running a t-shirt printing company. Uh, I made a hat that lets me feel north and let me feel music through my fingertips and all this stuff. And it was, it was great. It was like, oh, where'd my PowerPoint presentation go? You closed it. Okay. So, uh, yay, look at this. I think it's going to work. Uh, how do you run it? Slideshow, play from start. Okay. And so, please, for the love of God. No? Can you get it so it just opens up the page? Just like, why does it do this? Okay, here we go. I'll just leave it. I'll leave it like this, and I'll, where's my mouse? Here's my mouse. Mm -mm -mm. Sorry, everybody.
I think I'm just going to have to open it halfway. So if I go PowerPoint, and then do we see what I see? Great. Close all these windows. Ignore. Now we can see this. This is fine. OK. Good. So <clears throat> 2011, started bringing this idea about like problem solving over to the Middle East. And I worked really hard at it. You know, I went, went to Egypt. We worked with a bunch of people there. You know, these communities, basically, you just raise a flag. And the people that are already there that memorize Avogadro's number kind of like come out of the woodworks. And so I started working with these people from Egypt. I met up with uh, Vladen in Beirut, actually, when we were doing uh, this kind of work there. And here are the Fikra Space crew in Baghdad. I finally made it, quote unquote, home, whatever you want to call where my parents are from. And so Baghdad to me had been like completely locked out. And I had to like, OK, here's me calling my mom, like, mom, I'm going to Baghdad. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you when I get back in a couple of weeks. <laughs> OK, yeah, it's going to be fine. <laughs> OK, and so after a couple of phone calls like this, it, was, it started becoming more normal. And I started being able to go back to Baghdad, started opening up like, with, with these awesome people. There's a little laser pointer. There, that guy over there, Saleh Zain, and he's one of the initial founders of Fikr Space. The logo is that little box in the top right. And it was really exciting. And I started to wonder um, if there was something about like, this whole open source hardware thing that let us solve real problems. You know, like the, 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 the problem solving brain of mine kept confronting harder and harder problems. And I kept like smashing into them. And my, my engineer's brain was like, man, OK, well, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and then terrorism. OK, right. Well, something about politics or something, right? We can, and I had no idea exactly what to do. And so slowly, I started trying to find ways to take my problem-solving approach and to address the challenges that I was facing. So here's my cousin Zaid. He had his leg amputated because he had diabetes during like the sanctions. And so I was like, oh, you know what we could do? We can use like 3D printing and 3D scanning to take a really accurate map of your leg, kind of clone something that my friend David Senge makes, which lets you remove pressure from sensitive areas so that he can walk again and become a little bit more healthy. And so here's Saleh working with some multi durometer silicon. Um, I don't remember why this happened. It's like, this is pretty normal in Iraq, I guess. Uh, I got handcuffed. Um, and uh, we, we were working on this, but that day that I came to work on this like multi molded, like multi durometer silicon prosthetic socket, three car bombs exploded in the country. Like literally, I got into the country and like the very next day, like <laughs> simultaneous, like uh, uh, coordinated attack. And I could see the plumes out in the distance. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like, why am I here? Why am I like working on this like tiny little problem when there's like clearly much, much bigger issues? to face. And so this is the television from that day. And it wasn't just Iraq. You know, I had just come from Syria, where I was bringing, I was following up on my friend's work to do alternative educational systems for refugee camps. He was like, these kids, they left their homes, they don't have schools. There's got to be like interesting educational pla like paradigms that we can bring in that are better than what they currently have. And I was doing some follow-up work there. And on the way home, there was a uh, car bombing in Lebanon. And so I had left Syria where I saw these like guys in beards coming from Cairo. Man, this is actually getting scary. Anyway, so I saw these people and I was like, wow, this whole like violence that I'm seeing in Iraq is a symptom of a much larger problem that's ranging from Syria to Lebanon to Iraq and, and all over the Middle East. And I started uh, getting kind of scared. So I flew home. And wait, this is kind of out of order. <laughs> I flew home. Come on. Click, 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 click. OK. So I flew home, and I started thinking about what, what are other ways that we can take this like DIY problem solving attitudes and start addressing issues of violence. And, and somebody reached out to me because they saw that I was working on this 3D printed prosthetic stuff. And they're like, we need to go to. Um, this place in Africa where there's, there's some violence and like, people are getting amputated. And I started working on like, this prosthetic hand project. And I started tr tr basically trying everything. Mwah. Dark. Dark. And I wasn't really happy with what was going on. Oh, shoot. OK, so uh, this, this picture is basically a post from Fikr Space in Baghdad that says, 
we can't do anything tomorrow like we had planned because there's to, like the city's closed down by the government and we can't like go and build our Arduino based like microcontroller projects because we can't safely get to the space. And so I started feeling kind of strange about the work that I was doing. I was thinking that there had to be like a better a better thing to do. And uh, I didn't know what it was. And so I went to some, oh, it's not going to be open. That's OK. I went to some conference called the Arab Bloggers Conference in Jordan. And I met up with a bunch of journalists. And I was like, whoa, another strategy, another approach. And they were working on like this data visualization uh, uh, workshop that I was a part of. And I started thinking about the problems that I was confronting and engineering, problem solving brain. I thought that the first step to getting people to do something about something is to get them to care about something. And I know that like music is a very emotional thing. And so I tried to create a musical experience of the violence in Iraq so that, who knows, just so I can do something about the problems that I was facing. Because I, can't, I couldn't help like, confronting these things without doing something about it. And so I made this, this, um, this sound file that basically sounds like this for every day. And then every day there's a car bomb, you hear boom. And the amplitude of the explosions were the number of people that died that day. And so just like listening to this, you could hear patterns and rhythms in the violence. You could hear, and really, ex like if you close your eyes and just imagine what you are hearing, like what it implies, it was like a really, really emotional thing for you. Like literally, when I was programming this thing and it ran, luckily, I'm not a very good programmer. I was basically just like staying up all night coding, and it ran. My, my blood turned to ice, and I just sat there, and I couldn't move for like 10 minutes. It was really bad. And uh, so I did, I did a thing. I felt like I made a little bit of progress, and I was able to think about the problems that I was uh, confronting a little bit better. And so I took this project, and I, I decided to, to like take it a step further. I had this idea if we could like create more ways to visualize this data and to create like an emotional experience for people, I don't know what will happen. Something, something. I'll be doing something about the violence that's happening in the place that I like to work, where my family is from. And so uh, what I thought to do, and this is a little description that I sent to a bunch of people trying to like, get help, is to create a project where every time a car bomb went off, we'd crush a statue, you know, just a little bit that represented Iraqi culture and history. And so it was supposed to create this sort of... Um, scene where you represent the Iraqis of every sort are ha like are proud of where they come from. They're like, yeah, we're the mother of civilization. We, like Hammurabi, like laws, that was us, you know? And Shi'i, Sunni, or Christian, or like Iraqis, like take that and, and take that as their sort of common heritage. And I wanted to show how uncivilized we were being by destroying civilization. And so I started this project. Oh yeah, that was... Don't worry about that. That's also just, don't worry about it. It's a chameleon. Um, uh, yeah, OK. So that was, that was my first thought about what to do. And then I, I carried on traveling. Basically, I'm taking you with me on my thought process as I, I'm basically like dragged across the world. And this is one of my friend's moms. Um, when I was actually, again, with, with uh, Vladin in, in Tunis, um, this hotel in... Uh, Afghanistan, where she works, had a shooting. I don't know if you guys remember, it was a couple months ago, but uh, it was supposed to be like the safest hotel in Afghanistan. And this is like some, somebody that was really close to me, and her mom also does work that I could empathize with. She, she lived in, this, in Vancouver, in North America, and she worked at creating like schools and educational um, uh, experiences for people in Afghanistan. And so it was like, oh, you know, like I could, could, I could see that. And then to know that she was dead, it, was ba it basically just did this to me, and I started feeling like, like this, you know? And I was just, just, I didn't know what to do. I was kind of melting. It felt like <laughs> everything was soaked. <sighs> and so the thing that I started doing was I started talking with one of my friends, uh, Joe, about these experiences, and we had these, uh, this idea before to kind of create a way to commemorate the people that have dead with positive actions. It's, it's like trying to convert 
horrible things into less horrible things. And so we made this, well, Joe mostly, uh, made this open source website called For the Dead. Come on. I was, ah, here it is. Okay. Mm. Okay, so For the Dead, basically you can really simply upload somebody's picture and say, this is somebody that died, and you just say what you're doing as an act of kindness to commemorate them as a human being. Instead of being sad about somebody or dropping flowers that kind of wilt on a gravestone, you say, you know what, like, that person was great, and I want to commemorate and remember them with a positive action. And this, this concept kind of comes from, like, my Muslim heritage of sadaqa jariyah, which is, like, uh, when you die, you can't get any more good deeds. So God, like, you were judged on how many good deeds and bad deeds you did. And so some of the things that you can do, or some of the things that people can do for you to give you more good deeds is to do good things in your honor and your name. And so that was what For the Dead was about. And then it just kept happening. Like, a couple of weeks after that, uh, the school that I was at in Syria, working on this like educational platform, had a missile strike. And one of my friends sends me a Facebook message filled with blood and like little kids' body parts. And he's like, hey, this is horrible. I don't know what to do about it. And I started thinking. I was like, oh my god, okay. Like, I can imagine myself there because I was there last summer. I could you see those walls standing and now they're crumbled. Like, what do I, what do, I do? What do I even think about this? Like, this poor little girl, her name is Katya. She, when he first told me about it, I was supposed to give a talk in Berlin, and she was still alive, but her, you know, she was in critical condition, and uh, she died while I was working in Berlin. And uh, again, again, like if you can imagine the whole planet soaked with like tears, maybe now like sprinkle more blood. I started just getting really, really depressed, and like my engineering problem-solving brain just kept like short-circuiting and like fizzling, and I was like, okay, okay, now what? Oh my God! 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 And uh, yeah, so this, is, this, <laughs> this may not be the kind of talk you're expecting. Uh, there's no like, really great solutions or like, positive like, answers. I'm, I'm taking you through my process and, and hoping to see like, what kinds of strategies that we can use to... My, my big goal right now is take like, horrible things and have them inspire positive things. And so that happened when I was in Berlin. And so when I came back home from that, I decided to really focus on my sculpture. And I had a, a, another idea, because as I was talking to my friend in Syria who sent me these pictures, I was like, you have to tell your story, Omar. Like, you have to tell people what happened in, in this uh, refugee camp. And he said, why? Like, who's going to come and rescue us? You know, America does not want to get involved in Syria. What am I supposed to do? And so I kept thinking to myself, like, what's the point? You know, like, what's the point of telling the story? And... And I thought about it for a while, and I, I thought I had, like, a good answer. And, th and the good answer is, <laughs> is if, if someone reads this story and sees, and sees Katya, and that night, you know, let's say that they have a daughter, he, he, he like, holds on to her just a little bit longer and, and kisses her, like, one more time before putting her to bed. Or if somebody else, like, is, is moved by this to, to just be a little bit more generous in their day, or, or a little bit kinder, then telling the story is important, even, even if it's a little bit. I'm not saying that they like, cancel each other out, but it's like you can either have bad stuff happen, and then everyone's sad, and it sucks, or you can have bad stuff happen, and people are sad, and then some people are inspired to do good. And so this kind of idea started appealing to me, and so I, I started working on the sculpture, but instead of only crushing, I decided to let people uncrush the sculpture. And so here's the sculpture. It's made out of wood. It looks like this. Um, this is, I guess, a little bit uh, more of a conclusion. But, okay, so here it is. Basically, it's this wooden sculpture, and inside of that thing is a figurine that is made out of clay and rubber. So the inside is made out of rubber, and it represents the Lamassu. So remember, Iraqis all love their, their heritage and like, like to look at themselves as the cradle of civilization, which they are, we are, whatever. And... Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, inside of there sits this figurine with rubber on the inside. And the reason the rubber is there is so that it can bounce back. The clay will get crushed, just like I thought. It will create a scene. We're representing the demolishing of a culture and a civilization. But the rubber will let, let it bounce back a little bit. And the way that it bounces back is, um, is like this. So every time a car bomb goes off, come on. Uh, you can't read this. I have to go closer to read it. Every time a car bomb goes off, a tweet goes out, and people verify whether or not something bad happened in Iraq. 
And when something bad happens, there's a Twitter, uh, one of those things also, list called kindness first responders. So a first responder is somebody that's like, oh my God, there's a fire. I'm going to like pour a bunch of water on it. Or like, oh my God, somebody got hit by a car. I'm going to go do CPR. <laughs> right? And a kindness first responder, somebody's like, oh my God, something horrible happened. I'm going to be like exceptionally nice today. And I have, I have <laughs> a small, small group of people that are deciding to be kindness first responders. And I'll read you some of their responses from some of the violence that happened in Iraq for the last few months. Oh, I cannot read this at all. Okay. Um, I opened my heart to a coworker who was expressing a minority opinion and made sure that he felt heard. Um, I wrote to a friend that I haven't talked to in a while. Um, wrote a heartfelt message of condolence to a friend whose beloved dog died. Okay. So, <laughs> this, this is the weird world, okay? This is really, really weird. Okay, so some people decided to blow up cars in Baghdad and kill a bunch of people, and then somebody, because of this, writes a letter to a friend whose dog died. It's not, it's not stopping the violence, but it's something. <laughs> it's not nothing. And so, uh, this, is, this is my response. This is where I sit right now, and... And all the other slides that I had up are gone. <laughs> so basically, I've come a long way from being this like Avogadro number memorizing Uber nerd. And even further uh, along from developing these community spaces where we're building these robots to do crazy things. And I'm like mashing my head against like, how do we look at a world that's so damaged in so many different ways? The more I travel, the more I look, the more I really understand that. We need everybody. And this is why the open source part is really important. So all these projects are, whoa. All of these projects are open source. And I'm working with all of the community spaces and anybody that wants to help. So if you guys are interested or if anybody's interested, I think we need to have more brains looking at problems and thinking about ways to solve it like together as communities, as, as, as people. And initially, my goal was to show people that they can. Okay, and just and then just like empower them with the tools and the knowledge that they can create, and now I'm hoping with my like these these kinds of projects to show why, you know, like why we do, why we make. Back 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 in the day, you know, when we were making these clay pots and like chipping arrows, each of these things served a purpose, a purpose for the greater good of the community, and I think we can like tap back into that common need for community and the common ability that we have to create and be innovative and to look at some of the challenges and address them together. Some of the work that I was doing here that I had some pictures of is uh, one of the common problems that we have between Kosovo and Iraq is this issue with depleted uranium. And initially, depleted uranium wasn't even on my mind. But some people invited me to uh, a peace tech camp in Erbil, and I met a person who works on a cancer organization for children in Basra. And he was like, Bilal, DU, huge problem. There's like radiation, people getting cancer, but there's all these like conspiracies of whether or not it's actually correlated. What can we do about it? People, people think, like, think that I know something. And so I asked my friends, and my friends make this Geiger counter for, they made it during the problems in Fukushima. So the hackerspace, along with a global uh, open source team from around the world, started realizing that there weren't enough Geiger counters that the government could provide safe and accurate information for people to be able to decide where it was okay to be. There was radiation all over Japan and no one really knew how to protect themselves. And so this team made this really neat open source modularly built Geiger counter that does data logging. And Safecast is this pretty big project now and they have a lot of coverage all over Japan. And so I was just piecing things together, and this, the international hacker community, of course, responds because they want to help. They want to see their tools be useful. And so we brought it here, and we were uh, to Basra, and we did some investigations there. And it's really just the first step. There's a lot more to do. We're, we're just beginning to explore what we can find out with these DIY technologies. There's a there's uh, problem of actually sampling the soil to figure out if the radiation is actually uranium-based or it could be some other uh, mineral or material. And um, this, is, this is where I'm at right now. I'm just looking into open source communities and open source technologies and trying to find 
as many people as possible to gather together to address some of the enormous challenges that we face today. And if you guys have any thoughts, I'll be here standing on a speaker. No, but it was just a joke. A okay. response to your Arabic, or your, <laughs> your, your mom's Arabic. Um, do you see any commonality between uh, Kosovo and Iraq, other than dates? Other than, other than the figs? The figs. No, the figs are from, uh, from Syria, this. man. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Kosovo and Syria got the figs in common. Um, Iraq is a big place, a lot bigger than Kosovo. And so, like, if we're talking about climate, there's a, a large variety. But one thing we do have in common is um, this, this issue with DU. And that would be an interesting thing. So the community spaces, the hacker spaces that are popping up in, uh, in Pristina and around in Kosovo, it would be really interesting for them to start communicating with some of the people in Basra that are also exploring this. There are some nicer things about working on this issue in Kosovo in that I don't think it, it's dangerous, but it's, it's not like assassination first uh, questions next kind of dangerous. In, in Basra, it's, it's more along those lines. Who here feels like they can actually do something? Okay, we got one, two. We got a couple. Okay. I hope to show with my complete incompetence that it's better to try and to make strides and to fail than to just watch the world pass us by. And like the slide that I really wanted to end with was my two nieces, whom like I adore. And I was thinking about them when Katya died, and I was realizing that like you know, it's kind of our responsibility to do something about the world. This is, this is what the hacker ethos is about for me. It's about seeing the world and seeing our hands and creating it. A lot of bureaucracy and a lot of like systems have taken away our engagement and realizing that that wall is some guy's idea and they put rocks down until it became a wall. And like the world is ours and it's our responsibility, really. Don't <laughs> think that like, oh yeah, you know, I'm in Kosovo, there's so much bureaucracy, I can't do anything. There's like layers upon layers of people above me. No, you know, like, you can you can do stuff <laughs>